we're back. Welcome back. Charles, well, I don't really need to tell you welcome back to Life Diffuse because you're always here. I know. You can't get rid of me. Sometimes I think I'm going to sign on and you're not going to be here. And then that would be a real <laughs> curveball for me. But yep. you're here. Everybody else is here. It's Light the Fuse, the one-stop shop for all Mission Impossible related goodness. And uh, yeah, we're back with Garvin Cross Part 2. I think people are going to like this one. What do you think? This is more of a uh, Jackie Chan podcast this episode, I think, <laughs> than anything else. Uh, yeah, we do talk about, we, but we talk about a lot of different movies from his career. And then, of course, we always bring it back to, to Mission at the end. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff in this episode, a lot of great stories. And, and yes, we do talk about a little bit more about Rumble in the Bronx And we get into Shanghai Noon, which is another Canadian shot Jackie Chan movie that he worked on. And he tells some really good stories about that. And and yeah, just I I love we'll talk more afterwards about some of the other stuff. But it's like hearing him talk about The Predator is really fascinating because that production, those troubled productions always fascinate us. We always wonder what we are obsessed. (laughs) So, so crazy. But before we get into it, actually, I wanted to bring up something. Um, Darren Baker one of our followers on Twitter, I believe, uh, he sent us an article because, you know, we found out that Tandy Newton's hair in MI2 was a wig. Oh, of course. Yeah. He dug up an article from 2017 that was all about Tandy Newton wearing her Mission Impossible 2 wig to the BAFTAs. Oh, so it's still in rotation. Yeah. So so it said Tandy has now revealed that the striking dark tresses, which this is from an article from Hollywood.com. Uh, the the hair which cascaded over her shoulders were the result of a wig, one which she was given on the set of the 2000 action movie Mission Impossible 2. And then she's, uh, she said, people kept talking about my hair at the BAFTAs. It was actually a wig. Nearly 20 years ago, I did Mission Impossible 2. I had three wigs in that, and they cost about 10,000 pounds each. We used two of them and would rotate them. Then there was this third one that was never used. The hairdresser on set made Tom Cruise give me the raw wig that cost ten grand. I never used it, but last night I got that wig out. And that quote's back from 2017 uh, after the BAFTAs. Wow. So not screen used, but no, I made guess not. For that the was production. the backup. Yeah, yeah. But still good. Still great. <laughs> I say. I'd love any wig from any Mission Impossible movie. I don't care who's worn it or hasn't worn yeah, it. Just, well, hey, yeah. we're, if anybody's got any Mission Impossible wigs out there just lying around, we will gladly take them and wear them yes. while we record the show. Yes. I think that would be great. <laughs> um, we should make that a Patreon goal of some kind. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's really that's a really fun story. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you, Charles. Oh, you're welcome. I feel like sometimes maybe the things I, I bring up to you are not not a winner, but that one was a winner. That's good. <laughs> I thought so. I mean, we love Tandy. We love wigs. Yes. And the fact that it was a Mission Impossible had that great Mission Impossible Two connection. I think I think that story was a winner. I think the listeners can tell us whether or not they were bored by that story. And um, but I'm I'm That's very the most pro important thing. that story. All right. Well, so why don't you give us your favorite part of the show? Okay. Well, I've got some shout outs this week, um, and of course. Uh, being led off by Jeremy Dillon and his podcast, My Favorite Album. And we want to remind everybody that Eddie Hamilton was a recent guest on there. Uh, We love Jeremy. We love Eddie. It's a wonderful interview. And Jeremy has tons of great interviews on his podcast, My Favorite Album, where he kind of quizzes people about the music they love and how it's influenced them and their work. And we've been on there a few times. We have. I suspect we will be back. I hope we're back this year. I thought our, our, our... Yearly wrap up was a real fun. Yeah, maybe that'll become a tradition. We'll see if Jeremy likes. I would us love enough to. to do that. I wouldn't blame him either way. No, I mean he's got a lot of stuff to do. Even though he's not asking Casey Musgraves for her rankings, which yeah, I don't. A whole I still don't issue. understand yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this episode is also brought to you by John B. Uh, it's also brought to you by Elvis Ripley and our newest shout out here, Suchet. So thank you all so much for your support of the show. It means the world to us. And uh, myself and Charles will be back right after this. Garvin Cross, part two. I feel like we should do like an inside the actor studio. Like, can we talk to Angelo? You know, <laughs> yeah. like that kind of thing. Like, yeah. what would Angelo say right now in this situation? Oh man, I gotta think of that one. 
<laughs> you kiss my ass and we'll let you go. <laughs> I love it. Oh, yeah. And then you got hit in the butt with that antenna or something. Did they really, oh, yeah. Did they, I assume they didn't really hit you with that thing, did they? Ah, uh, light touch. Okay. You know, that's good. It was, um, <laughs> I can tell you. There's funny stories all over the place, man. Um, we're about to film that sequence and they had to put a tattoo on my butt. A, you know, dragon tattoo or whatever it was, snake. And uh, so Jackie radios down to the girls who I have to, who are doing it. And they're the Asian gals from uh, Hong Kong. And I go down and they're like, oh, sorry, we, you, we put, you know, a tattoo on your butt. I go, yeah, okay. So I pull them in there giggling. And then, so in the meantime, though, Jackie had been on the radio to everyone. Everyone come to the roof. Come up to the roof. And I didn't know this. And so we're about to shoot the sequence where he hits me with the antenna. I have to pull my pants down. And we get up there and, and we're about to go. And Stanley's like, okay, here's the plan. Just, okay, great. Got it. Okay. And uh, I turn around. And then the action. And I turn around. And I pull my pants down. And I go, I'll tell you what. You kiss my ass and we'll let you go. And I wiggle my ass. And, and uh, cut, cut. Coven. Very good, Coven. And I turn around and everyone's laughing. And the whole cruiser, like a hundred people are just all lined up, just killing themselves laughing. And Stanley says, Coven, Coven. Very good, Coven. But you pull your pants down too far and we see your balls. <laughs> so, uh, wow. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so. And, uh, but that was great. It was a, a wonderful experience again. I mean, he was so talented. The Jackie team, you know, his team were super talented. It was really crazy and, and fun. And it was kind of the first era of wires that you, that were sort of taking place that Chinese had brought over and, you know, flying people and hand pulling people, you know, right. instead of ratchets. And, and they were braiding wire sometimes with their hands, with knotting it and really different. It was, it was wonderful to see. I've heard that like ja Jackie's like philosophy with wire work back in the day, at least, was that he wouldn't use it to to like enhance. It was more to enhance the effects of of a punch or something like. If, so if he yeah. kicked somebody or punched someone, you'd use a wire to yank them and have them go flying and stuff like that. And that's what they were doing. That was their, some of their technique. Yeah, like in the in the fort sequence where the you know the pinball, the pool table, all that. I wasn't in there because Angela wasn't there at that moment, but I just came and watched and helped. And it was, yeah, they were doing that, pulling That's people. Awesome. And, and then also changing the frame rate a little bit just to speed it up a tiny bit, but not a lot. That's right. So Dan Mindell, which you worked on Shanghai Noon as well. We, yeah. had, we had Dan yeah. Mindell. I'm not sure if it's Mindell or Mindell. He was the cinematographer for Mission Impossible 3, but he also shot Shanghai Noon. And he said that, I think he said they would, that what, a trick that he learned from Jackie was shooting 22 frames a second yep. to make just it just look a, a little bit faster. Yeah, and you and it was wonderful because you couldn't tell. Yeah, and it just gave a little more strength to the to the scene to that whole you know fight. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. What did you do on Shanghai Noon? Um, I was one of the guys. I was just I was there only for about a week. I was just one of the Western guys. You know, I came. A buddy who said, "Hey, come on over," and uh, we need a bunch of bodies. And I was working on something else. I said, "Yeah, I'd love to." So I went over and had a beard and you know, cowboy. And, uh, it was the horseshoe scene where I was going to ask, was it the horseshoe fight? Cause that's like the, yeah. that's maybe the best scene in the movie when Jackie ties the rope to a horseshoe and then throws, Oh my God, that's so great. Yeah. So that was it. Yeah. That was with that guy. One of the two guys there. Yeah. It was really rem remarkable. Like just being there again with him. And he, so one of his guys, I'm in makeup and he got, and about the second day, I wasn't going to go over and sort of point myself out that, Hey Jackie, cause he was quite busy. And, uh, Guy looks over at him and goes, Angelo. <laughs> 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 so about a day later, his assistant, I forget what her name was, comes over to me and says, Jackie would like to see you. And I said, oh, okay. And then another day goes by. And I just thought, oh, he's so busy. It doesn't matter. I'm only here another couple of days. You know, I'm just an ND stunt guy. And, uh, and then we went for a walk, just him and I. We talked about Rumble. We talked about him becoming big in, in Hollywood. It was actually a, wow w one of those pivotal moments in my life. It was actually... That had to have been like right after rush hour too, right? When you were shooting that? Yeah. So I mean, he must have really just hit it huge. Yeah. And we had a great walk through the Western set where him and I were just walking and no one around and we were chatting. And, and uh, uh, my buddy, had uh, unfortunately, Mark Actorstream had passed away by then. And uh, who was, the, like I said, again, the stunt coordinator on Rumble. And, you know, he, he gave his condolences. And, but we talked about other stuff for about half an hour. Wow. You know, just look, a life, you know, how it transformed his life, Rumble. That's amazing. Uh, well, I could grill you about Jackie Chan all day. But I feel like for the sake of our listeners who want other things. Uh, so you, you were on Elf. 
Um, I wanted to <laughs> yeah, that's what people did, are really looking for, Charles. Yeah. Like, well, this, I had one specific goes. question. Did you do the jump onto the Christmas tree? No. Okay, because that stunt is amazing. We did some green screen stuff as bodies, and I and I really honestly, I, I'm sad to say it wasn't much, but it was it was the sleigh for Central Park, and it was a body. It was um, James Con. Was it no? Jim, no, James yeah. was yeah. down below. It was but James Con? Yeah. But yeah, but I was down. I was in the sleigh. We were lining up a bunch of shots and doing things, and um, can't remember what else I did. But sorry to say, because it was just a blur. That right? Uh, I was I was only there for a day, and we did a couple different things. But I I dropped kicked uh, Will Ferrell. Yeah. Oh, that's good. No, I no, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what about uh, Inception? Because you were you did stunts and you were you played a part in Inception as well, right? Yeah, I was um, the stunt commander. Unfortunately, I didn't get credited, but uh, I'm the guy on uh, the snow commander up on the ski, in the ski sequence. So I was actually one of the skiers because I, I grew up skiing, and I was one of the guys with the machine guns chasing. Wow. After yeah, and uh, and then um, we would walk around with our. It wasn't. It was in the snow around in Alberta up at uh, a ski area called Fortress. And it wasn't super cold, which was great. It was um, just below freezing, which was perfect for shooting. And um, we would walk around with our uh, hoods up. Because if you look at the movie, everyone in that sequence has their their balaclava, black balaclava on. And we'd, you know, take a break between shots and we'd all lift them up so we could, you know, take a breather. And Christopher Nolan saw me. And then he went, oh, I want to do homage. Basically, he told the stunt coordinator, I want to do homage to a James Bond chase or the yes. ski sequence. And that guy over there looks like Daniel Craig. <laughs> I didn't know this until after. And uh, one of the stunt coordinators yells over to me, and I'm walking, and he goes, hey, Garvin. And he knew I could act. And so, can you act? He did it on purpose. <laughs> and he was smiling with his back to Christopher Nolan. And, Chris, and, he, and I go, oh, yes, of course, I, I can act. And then I was like, yeah, get him up on the... Get him up on the hummy. So no one, no one picked you out because you look like Daniel Craig. Yeah, so it did help me. Yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, did you? I mean, because that seems like that sequence is a big homage to Honor Majesty's Secret Service. Did you? Did you ever hear it, Nolan or anybody talking about that beyond that? I mean, was there any interaction? Just, just the interaction that they had after, like uh, uh, this. When I I went down to um, our rap party, and I walk in and. And there's Chris Nolan at a table with the stunt coordinator, the Canadian stunt coordinator called Brent Wolsey. And, uh, and Wally Fisker was at the table. And as I walked in, I was, I didn't really see people in there. You hear this name, get over here. And it was the, the day after we shot that sequence and, uh, it was a rap party. And I walk in and Wally goes, Hey, great job, man. Good job out there. Good acting. And, and Christopher said, yeah, thank you. And he says, yeah, I wanted it to be a kind of a James Bond. So, you know, that, that action type sequence. That's no, you know, the, like you said, you know. That's cool. Yeah, so that was kind of cool, yeah. Tron Legacy. Yeah. It says you, I think I, I can find you're looking for your credit again. It was something about, did you ride a motorcycle? Did you do one of the light cycles or what was, uh, what did you do on that? Uh, no, I was in a car. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was in a car. I was driving one of the cars. I think it was a cop car on that one. Yeah, driving a, a cop car stunt. Oh, after, after he takes off in the motorcycle? Yeah, you got it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so I did that. That sequence and, and another great one, you know, I think was um, Fantastic Four. You know, was a big one. It's coming back. Maybe you can do something for the new one. I'll have to be the older guy that gets a little slower. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I chose cars. <laughs> you you worked on Predator, the Predator, yeah, which had an infamous production. Uh, nightmare. <laughs> nightmare. It, it was, um, I think it was very, uh, yeah, I, I feel sorry for those guys. It was, well, tell us what, well, did, I mean, the, the story is, and you can correct me if I'm wrong with that. They, they shot the entire third act in daylight and then they went back and had to shoot it at night. But there were also things like there, I've seen photos of like good predators that joined the fight. Wow. Yeah. It was kind of weird. Um, I don't know all the inside thing. Oh, I was there for a week. Uh, we were doing the whole... The, I don't even think that section made it in the movie, to be honest, because it was we, they reshot stuff. They didn't... Cha- you know, it was in the gravel gravel pit where the Predator comes out of his out of the ship. Mm-hmm. And there was... The military was all there. And there were so many reshoots, like, over and over. From My buddies were, were there all the time. And they just... I, I forget. It was funny, because one of the guys who was stunt coordinator on it uh, hired him the other day. And... I think it was astronomical amount of cancellation days, like 165. It was crazy. It was what is a cancellation day exactly? 
where they're just about to you're you're going to show up and they cancel you. Oh, okay. Yeah, and they go well, next day. And does that mean the they have you on hold through that too? Are they they're paying you? Some of them, some of them, wow. but you know, I don't know how it all worked to be honest financially for all those guys. I just know that they get they made a lot of money because they kept getting canceled and being brought back. And, <laughs> you know, just just the length of it. That's production nightmare, I imagine. Wow. Yeah, there was a, I think there was a whole third act set at Area 52 as well that they didn't. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know about that. Yeah. Yeah, wasn't there a picture you showed me at one point drew of like predators on a tank or something during the day? Yeah, yeah, they were like Was good. that the original finale? Yeah, that was the sequence that we were in. So we had tanks and everything in the military there, yeah. What were you doing in that sequence? What part did you play? Um, I was a stunt military guy. So we were just, you know, getting shot and we'd sort of double each other or, you know, it'd be a different guy over in the next area. And so you were, were you battling against the predators? Yeah. And then there was good predators yeah, too, there were for, good like predators, you said. Yeah. yeah. So it was confusing to us a bit. I think they were just shooting some, you know, some different stuff that day. Yeah. <laughs> wow. What a nightmare. Those days. Yeah. Those days. Wow. Yeah. Lord. Yeah. Wow. We always love fascinating movies that, uh, <laughs> that, that got <laughs> compromised in different ways. We always love to hear stories about those. Well, it wasn't, uh, maybe it wasn't quite apocalypse now, but it was um, definitely a <laughs> lengthy one. <laughs> Good um, yeah. There's a movie that was a concert movie. It was IMAX that Nimrod Antal directed. It was Metallica Through the Never. Oh, yeah. Yeah, wild. What did, Were you in the, because in the, there's sort of a movie portion of the. Yeah. Where uh, the No, he was, actors... he was playing bass, actually, Charles, uh, in that one. Um... <laughs> did you play bass for yeah. Metallica? Yeah, because yeah. I, I was like, okay, what's the safest position here right this moment? Yeah. Bass looks good to me. <laughs> I can figure that one out. There's no cars. Um, yeah, no, we were, uh, we actually were a group of the guys, that thugs that were chasing the guy, and we lit on fire and beat up. Wow. Ooh. So I was part of that gang. So that was the sequence where we lit the, he had a full body burn one of the stunt guys and we were beating him with sticks. Did, did, did you saw that section? Yeah, we both saw it in IMAX. Yeah. yeah. We saw it in theaters. I haven't seen it since, but I, I thought that, you know, we're both big fans of the director and uh, yeah, it was yeah. A, it was a very cool looking movie. It was really interesting. I mean, I love the lighting. Yeah. You know, just from that, it was just super cool. And we shot it outside, run along alleys and I love the look of it. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good one. Well, to bring it back to mission impossible too, you worked with a mission impossible director Mr. John yeah. Wu, hello. Yeah, on that was yeah. He was pretty cool too. Jeez, you know, mine went. I think my first one was hard boiled, right? Yeah. But I loved watching. Yeah. Yeah. What was it like on on paycheck? Uh, paycheck was great. I mean, I got I was in a car again. You know, stunt driving, and we had motorbikes and. Was that the motorcycle chase? Yeah. We need yeah. to ask you about a rig or something that that. Okay. Okay. So there's that shot where. Charles and I have loved this shot since we saw it in the theater many, many years ago. Yeah. And it kind of like, it kind of catches up to, it's right behind Affleck and Uma Thurman on the bike. And it just seems like it's some kind of crazy thing. Oh, you know what I'm talking that about? Was the, I think that was the ultimate arm. Okay. At that point. So do you know what the ultimate arm is? Or a Russian arm? Uh, no, not the details of each. So go, go ahead. So picture a Mercedes, say 550 uh, SUV you know, that crossover uh, style. And then it's all painted sort of a matte black. And then you would mount, okay, remember when we were kids or that may still have them, the Lazy Susan on a table where you could spin the yeah. right. the table. And uh, so picture this is kind of a simplified way to describe it, but you, you mount that, but that is the base of a camera platform on the roof. So it's bolted through it, the roof's enforced, uh, reinforced, sorry. And um, and then there's an arm that could be nine feet, eleven feet that extends out, and it can now turn. That arm can turn with a camera on the end of it, 360 degrees out in front of the hood of the car and behind the car by you know four feet. So it can go 360 degrees around. And on that is a camera, of course. And then there's cables that go with that into the interior of the car. And uh, there's people in the car. One, they're on monitors. And they're able to, one guy is in the back of the car and he's able to spin that tabletop and arm 360 degrees and also tilt it up and down. And then also then also in there is the camera operator who that has the cables that go into the car, roof of the car, and he can operate that camera from the end of that arm. And so that camera tilts and pans as well. And so now the car chase, the driver in that car chases the other vehicle. And that arm extends, and now that arm can swing. So you can actually reach over 
out to the bumper, you can reach over to the hood of that car that you're chasing or motorbikes, for instance. So that's how they did that. It looks like a helicopter shot almost. You're rushing up. It just yeah, it gets so close to him though. Yeah. It's so just, amazing. The, the, the shots are so dynamic. It's yeah. And, and it's now you can sort of start pulling off some of those shots with drones, but that they weren't really in operation at that point. So yeah, wow. that's how it's done. Um, if you look up on, you can probably go ultimate arm. Um, there's a company up here called Peacemaker in Canada. There's many companies in the state or three or four of them in the States and around the world. There's a few companies, but, uh, you'll see the, you'll see the, the picture of the car. You'll, maybe uh my description isn't as good but wow that's cool we use those a lot for car commercials oh yeah that makes sense yeah you know that nice kind of grill shot the tire um, we do a lot of that with any of the the stunt sequences now right wow and then you can incorporate the drones as well so you're flying by the cars and over the cars and you know head-ons with a drone and also with the camera cars yeah what did you do on uh, jennifer's body jennifer's body i uh, we were on fire. I remember that. Didn't... Oh yeah, yeah with the with the bar burning down at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You personally were on fire. Uh huh. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. How does that feel? Yeah, what's that like? Hot. No, I'm joking. Yeah, um, it's um, <laughs> it's zen. You got to be so zen. Really? And it's, Where does your mind yeah. go? I think it's like just focusing on you know on anything that I don't know uh, if you're an athlete. And nope. you're going to do, uh, nope. you know, you're going to, you're about to go into a football game. You're focusing on how that outcome is going to be, how your play is going to run hockey, how you're going to take that, you know, soccer, ski racing, golf, how you're going to hit that ball and how you're going to put it. And just your Zen, you're, you're just really uh, trying to bring it all down into a focus point, one point and just be really quiet. Do you worry at all? Uh, I think it's always healthy to have a little bit for sure. Do you think like. I didn't see Paris or something. You know, I would think like that. That's, how, that's what I would be thinking if I was. Like, yeah. yeah. Damn, I knew I should have had that other glass of wine. Yeah, exactly. I didn't, I didn't finish my book that I just started. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's always important to have a little bit of, I'm not going to say it's fear or if it's a little bit of nervousness or just so that keeps you on your toes and to keep you focused. I think that's important. How many times have you been on fire? Many um i've done quite a few burns really um like yeah more, i did one i did like more than like, five uh, more than ten. Oh yeah yeah probably a couple dozen on film Ooh. oh my gosh um you know and then re you you rehearse it and you practice it and i mean i i did i didn't really show up in the movie too well but in revenant um i did six three that day and four seven burns I don't even yeah. remember anybody being on fire in that movie. I know. It's like, it's crazy because you'd think it would be one of those things they'd sort of want to have come. But what happened was uh, in the background when, so there, it's the first fight where the Indians are attacking the the, the fur traders and uh, Leo comes running along and then he shoots a guy in the tree right near, and the guy gets an arrow in his neck. There's a guy that gets an arrow in his neck and then the, then shoot, Leo shoots someone out of the tree and a guy falls and there was a scene where the camera was going to pan around and there I was walking, burning on fire. <laughs> and uh, and they changed it so I was kind of slightly background. And in the movie, it looks like the distant background. <laughs> There's a little tiny burn thing going on back there. Oh, but it was interesting for that one because everything was a timing issue because... It's all like oneers, right? Yeah, oneers. So we were counting. So Leo had to shoot the guy. The guy on the ground that was dead or playing dead near me had to be lighting me on fire. And then I had to turn. So we had to get there before the burn had to be happening before they got there with camera. So it was always a timing. We Is did. that like a selling point? Like when you're up for a job, like, hello, I can uh, bur get burned real good. I can fall out of a car, <laughs> whatever you need. Like <laughs> Exactly. It's the auditioning for stunts. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Last night I lit myself with a malt of cocktail. Yeah. <laughs> you're hired. It was an accident, <laughs> but it was a good burn. <laughs> Wow. I would be worried about my hair. Do you worry that your hair is going to get, I mean, what kind of protective stuff do you have over your... We we have a, it's gel. You know, it's there's a gel, a gel okay. that we use. It's a stunt friendly gel. And um, there's some really amazing technicians out there now, fire burn specialists that have created protective gels that, you know, they're sort of a milky substance or a wet, you know, and that look great. And your face, you got to protect your face a lot. Wow. Um, so you have, so you're, are you covered in this gel and then you're, and then is that... And is there another substance over that that is flammable or is it all one gel that protects you and goes on fire? 
Typically, you're not putting that fire gel on your face. You're, you're keeping it on your, your wardrobe or you can put it on your the fire gel. So you do put a, a protective gel on and then you can actually put a fire gel, which lights on top of that. Okay. And you can do that on your bare arms with some of the nice, with some of the, the materials we have now. And a lot of it is on your, your wardrobe, your costume. And in that sequence, we had leathers on, which is great because it's protective to a certain degree. And then what happens is you light to a certain degree up on your body. And then the flames will shoot up past your ears and your mm. head, and you just have to keep moving a little bit. In that sequence, Gosh. it was kind of, yeah, it's it's um it's it's pretty interesting, yeah, for sure. Wait, so but how does your hair stay there? He has gel on you his gel. hair. You gel, I thought you said you only gel on your body. Sorry, I'm i okay. Look, I'm I'm, I'm a little and slow. And your hair, gotta, and in your ears, I'm trying in your ears, in your, on, in your ears. Yeah, you put in your ears, you up your nostrils a little bit, oh just so you don't burn anywhere. I just oh. want to be squibbed. Yeah. What about your What about your eyeballs? Do you have like a glasses, the goggles, or something? Not when you're doing an open face one. You just you're keep just your doing eyes your, closed. Yourself. You kind of squint. Oh you do God. squint. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is horrifying. Just bring Just bring some squibs over, Garvin. I need to get okay. get get this. I want big, bloody. You know, I want like Django and Chain squibs. Just you guys should do that. You should You should actually interview a special effects guy that and have him come and and squib you because it's. It's actually an interesting thing to do. I know. Drew keeps talking about it. He really wants to be squibbed in a in a movie. So yeah. or just yeah. like in the neighborhood. I mean, as happen. long as nobody thinks that I've actually been shot a bunch of times. Yeah, you might want to have the person you're with not have a anything in his hand. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this is how I frame Charles for murder. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You did not bring me coffee today. <laughs> I know you've got a, you've got Slumberland coming up on Netflix. Yeah. Do we should we yeah. should we uh, plug that? Sure. I mean, I don't know how much we can talk about it, but you know, it was really uh, that was really cool. Um, it was a I got to drive the Ranchero. For the actress, I was, she rarely was in the car. We had a stunt double in the left-hand driver's seat. And I was in a right-hand driving, ran, uh, El Camino, sorry, Rancher El Camino. And um, so we were uh, in the sequence. It's, I don't know if you you know much about Slumberland, do you know? Well, it's based on the Windsor McKay stories, right? Yeah. And Momoa's yes. in it. I saw the trailer, so I know Momoa okay, has great. horns. That's about. I haven't seen the trailer yet. So. Oh, yeah. So did they have the vehicle in it? I don't know if they did. It's a pretty fantastical yeah. trailer. So yeah. We're doing a chase sequence. So he's in on the gar- big garbage kind of truck thing, right? And uh, it's a it's a monster, huge truck, like massive one. And the the vehicle I'm driving ha- comes up beside it and they're bumping. They're kind of he's it's, you know, that fantastical fantasy land and it can and the car gets spun away. And so I spent I was like, eight days driving on an airport. And then, of course, they'll make that a fantasy world, mm-hmm. you know, computerized. And uh, but right hand drive was tricky there because the left side, I always had to the actress was in the left or the stunt double. The actress only once in the car with me when we were sliding to a position that had to be stopped a couple feet before what was to, to be a cliff. And then she'd be looking over the cliff. But the stunt double for her looked amazing and was always on the left side. So it looked like she was driving. And then I had to pull up beside whatever and, and act off of that and be within some inches and a few inches or six feet, four feet, three feet, two feet, you know, behind it and always driving from that right position. So yeah, it was a lot of fun and tricky at the same time. Well, we, we asked people a couple of questions every week. Everybody gets these questions and I think we've come Mm -hmm. to the part of the show so, assuming you've seen the rest of the Mission Impossible movies, not just the ones that you were a part of, do you want to rank the Mission Impossible movies from your maybe your favorite to least favorite? Well, I could probably give you a one to five or seven or ten or you know, like um. There's only six, so you don't have to yeah. do that much. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm gonna say it was definitely probably the second favorite one. Yours was the second. Yours was yeah. the second favorite. Well, what's yeah. your, which is your favorite one? I'm trying to. I'm having a bit of a brain fart with the plane and everything else. Was that was, was Rogue Nation? Impressive. That's five. Yeah, that's your favorite. Yeah. I think so. Okay, that's with the the opera sequence and everything in that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, people have. You know, it's all subjective. In in the end, certain people have certain what they like. That one come. That one's a lot of people's favorites. So you're in good company. Did you see Fallout in terms of stunts? I mean, that one's pretty damn yeah. impressive with the halo. I jump mean, that was and impressive. Helicopters. Yeah. And... I mean, I'm pro- I'm gonna be biased, right? Because the halo jump was incredible and all that stuff. Yeah. So, but I'm biased because I got to work on and that whole feeling of being there is probably gonna 
favored me a little of more. Of course, yeah, yeah. That. Yeah. Well, the other question we ask people is, you know, what what is your favorite Tom Cruise hair style? Are you a long hair guy? Or are you a short hair guy? You got to be up close and personal <laughs> to that long hair. Well, one of those longer so haircuts. Yeah. yeah. What was, uh, I don't know, you know, I almost think that uh, Risky Business was pretty funny, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, I think that's a good one. Well, Garvin, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. Um and turning it into a Jackie Chan podcast. <laughs> yes. Yeah, sorry. Thank you for yeah, indulging kinda, me in that. <laughs> we got sidelined a little. I'm wearing my Jackie Chan shirt today, actually. Oh, you are? Awesome. <laughs> I have a jacket from him. Yeah. Which was great. Signed by him. You got to send us pictures of that jacket. But I will. But yeah, thank you so much. I mean, I think it was worth the uh, the two-year harassment campaign that Charles I leveled. I apologize immensely. No, <laughs> no worries at all. We know every. We, we yeah we, we we hound a lot of people. You're not the only one. No, but good for you guys to keep it up because uh, really I, I was you know not the best candidate at the best you know to return phone calls and stuff. So what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So that's yeah. true. Well, we really appreciate you making the time for us. And yeah, please keep in touch if there's anything else we can do. Uh, let us know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know I can't tell you about a project I just finished, but it was just immense, a huge commercial. Really. Let's yeah, see. Let's see if we can no. guess what it can is. Let me guess. <laughs> yeah, see. they'd kill me. I'm on an NDA, oh, but uh, yeah, it was. But a huge director. And... Huge director. Okay, I assume it's filming in Canada, so we'll, we're going to figure it out. Huge director. Okay. Yeah, but great people and big, big five. It was five days of full on, which was great. A lot of fun. Wow. Yeah, we'll talk about that when it. Yeah, comes absolutely. Out. Yeah, we'll check back in with you when, when it does. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for the time. Okay, guys. All the best. And we're back. Charles, how you feeling? It's hard to say goodbye. It is always hard to say goodbye, especially because he's so nice. He's got the, you know. I know. Just the Canadian nice thing. I mean, he's just such a such a great guy. It was, it was really fun talking to him, and he had so many great stories. So it's always so hard to say goodbye to our guests. We have so many wonderful people that we've met over the years through the show, and some of them have become dear friends. And Yes. It's been such an amazing journey to be on. It has. But, it has. Uh, I love that... Uh, I love that the uh, that he was a part of the horseshoe fight in Shanghai Noon. That's like my favorite scene in that movie. It's such a great. Do you remember that scene at all? Mm-mm. He Jackie Chan ties this rope to a horseshoe and then he just swings it around and does all these you know kung okay. fu moves. That was kind of like the whole thing with Jackie in that movie was like I want to mix the old west with the east, and so that was like one of those instances of he uses the horseshoe as a like a kung fu weapon. It's cool. Uh, very cool scene. Uh, I'm gonna, I want I want to rewatch and, and look and spot him in there now. But I also love that Jackie like took a walk with him to reminisce about how his career had taken off since Rumble in the Bronx. Because it's so crazy because Jackie had like basically given up on making it in America at that point when Rumble in the Bronx came out. I think it was actually Tarantino that convinced New Line to pick up Rumble in the Bronx and put it in theaters. Because he didn't, it wasn't, that movie wasn't made for an American release. He was just making his usual movies. That's what Jackie was doing. And uh, because he had tried a couple of times in the 80s to break through in America and failed miserably with Battle Creek Brawl and The Protector. Uh, Like it's in the early 80s and then again in 86 he tried. But Hollywood like just wouldn't let him do the make the movies the way he likes to make them. Because, you know, he took, you know, like Drunken Master 2, he took four months to shoot the climax of that movie. That's just the kind of stuff they wouldn't let you do. To like, you know, Jackie has all, all, all had all power back then in, in Hong Kong and could to just be an absolute crazy man with his perfectionism. But anyway, I could talk for hours about Jackie Chan. This is not a Jackie Chan podcast, so I will stop now to spare you and our listeners. Uh, no, I thought it was great. I love, you know, <laughs> I feel like he still remains an, a sort of enigmatic figure, especially in the West. So hearing people's interactions with him. We obviously just had Maggie Q on, who is a sort of protege of his. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's very illuminating. And it's a it's a part of the industry and modern cinema that not too many people uh, get to take a look at. So I feel very lucky that we kind of get to peek behind the curtains of that a little bit. Also, we got to peek behind the curtains of a big old clusterfuck known as The Predator. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, to hear Garvin just as bewildered as the rest of us was pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, 
It makes me want. I I only saw it once, and it makes me want to take another look. I'm just curious about it. I mean, the whole the idea that they reshot the entire third act at night instead of day. I mean, it just everything just sounds insane. Well, yeah, yeah. You know, you always see um, concept art that pops up on Instagram, like people's like NDAs, you know, run out, and they right. they post. <laughs> Photos of human hybrids and spider hybrids and all these things. It was you could tell it was a much different movie. Didn't they have a bunch of different endings planned too? Like surprise, it's not a twist because it, they didn't actually shoot it right. But because they had ideas of like having Ripley show up from the Alien movies. Ripley show end. up, Arnold show up. And so this is not yeah. a spoiler because it didn't actually happen. They were gonna weren't they gonna have try to get Arnold back from the original Predator or something? Yeah, they, they yeah. tried all these different. Actually, wasn't it gonna be Ripley with Newt from Aliens? I don't know if Newt, maybe Newt was part of it, but yeah, I think the Ripley one was definitely a part of it. I, I talked to uh, Fred Decker a few years ago, and he kind of told me some stuff. We should have him on the sh- on the Patreon just to talk he about- He was a co-writer? Yes, he was a co-writer. Okay. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I love Shane Black so much. Uh, he's made some of my favorite movies, and intellectually, it, it, it sort of made sense to be like, yeah, because he's in the first movie. Have him do a Predator movie. But I think in the end that might have not been the best mix of <laughs> ideas. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where the disconnect <laughs> happened, but I feel like Shane Black's movies are very dialogue driven. He's just so great with dialogue and, and funny characters and stuff. And Predator to me is like more of a visual action. Like the, pre- the the third act of the original Predator, which is one of I think both of our favorite movies ever. It has like ten words spoken in the whole like last like twenty minutes of that movie. It's all just visual. Yeah. Arnold versus this monster. Wait, are you telling me you didn't love the crazy uh, lunatics that are hanging out with Boyd Holbrook? <laughs> you know, Thomas Jane, the guy from Game of Thrones, Keegan Michael Key. They were also such crazy characters, Charles. <laughs> Remember that. I don't really remember the movie that well, to be okay. honest. I will, I will, I will, I'm going to go back and watch it again, but I know that I, I shouldn't be so hard on Shane Black because it does sound like the studio really meddled a lot in what he was trying to do. But anyway, we also talked about uh, the. He, we'll put photos in our show notes. He talked about the Russian arm and how they shot that, uh, how they shot the uh, the motorcycle chase in Payback, and so we'll put pictures of that Russian arm that he was talking about uh, that they used for commercials and they used for that sequence as well. Um, and I don't really have anything else to talk about other than I guess I should give our special thank you. Oh, yes, please do. I want to give a special thank you to Mike Brown and Jacob Ballard. Uh, thank you, Mike and Jacob. And I also want to credit our music composer, Kevin Blumenfeld. And I want to credit our editor and mixer, Luke Person. And tell everyone to check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash light the fuse. We do bonus episodes there every week. And if you sign up, you'll get all of our old bonus episodes. There are far too many of them, and you can get them all. So if you're feeling like you need more Light the Fuse in your life, then sign up for the Patreon. Can you imagine that, though? Can you imagine this show not being enough for people? <laughs> no, I don't. I mean, I just want to I wanna turn this off halfway through, and I'm <laughs> you know, part of it. You but you know, know what? So... We keep it short. I feel like most podcasts are a little longer. Maybe that makes you feel like you need a little bit more Light the Fuse in your life. We, we actually call the Patreon Light the Fuse Plus. Yes. So if you want to sign up for Light the Fuse Plus, go to patreon.com slash light the fuse. And also check out uh, our Tee Public page, which is linked from our website, lightthefusepodcast.com. In the merch section, you can see a few samples, and then, and then from there you'll get a link directly to our Tee Public store, and you can buy a shirt or a magnet or a pin or whatever you want. And then also while you're on the website, check out our episode guide and look at the show notes for each episode going all the way back to episode one f- over four years ago. Craziness. Um, what else, Drew? Well, I want to make sure people are following us on Light the Fuse pod on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, that's really our, you know, kind of ground zero for the, the latest breaking news. And also to like, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you're listening to this podcast. It raises awareness for the podcast. And speaking of raising awareness, just tell people about the show. If you like it, if you don't like it, don't say a word. Just keep it to yourself. But if you like it, tell people. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, that's a uh, word of mouth. Yeah. So it was very. You know, past guest Todd Vaziri did a nice little Twitter thread about our show recently. That was really nice. Did you see that? I did. I couldn't believe how much of a sweetie he was. Yeah, it was. It was, it was really, really nice. It was very, very wonderful of him to do that to spread the word. And uh, he listed all of our 
episodes that we've done with various VFX geniuses over the years. And uh, yeah, that kind of stuff always helps. So thank you all so much for listening and spreading the word. And we'll be back next week with who, someone. Someone. We don't really know. Yes, <laughs> but th- we will be here. We're working on it. We've got a few things in the works. We're and uh, yes. as always, we're, we're, we're always here. So yes. you, will, you will hear us and hear from us. Thank you. Okay, see you then. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcast at gmail.com. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.